I love the, the piano, the violin combo, and the a cappella. I don't, I don't know, honestly, if there's a sweeter sound than a congregation of believers singing praises to the Lord. Well, let's pray, and then we'll open up God's Word. Father, help us now to come to the climax, the pinnacle of the worship service where You declare truth to us. Help us to have hearts ready to receive it. Help me, Lord, as, as the waiter, merely bringing the meal that You've prepared to the people, not to mess it up. I pray, Lord, that I would simply speak truth. That I would accurately portray the words of Your Son from John chapter 5. And that it would not return void upon the souls of the hearers. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Well, on January 29th, 2019, just a little bit over four weeks ago, at two o'clock in the morning, on the streets of inner city Chicago, a crime is said to have taken place. A black man and an openly gay actor was reportedly beaten and insulted by two men motivated by racism and political bigotry. Upon reporting the events, the man's case quickly circulated throughout the media. Labeled as a wicked hate crime and an act of domestic terrorism, his story soon became front page news. In an interview with ABC News, he, with tears welling in his eyes, called for justice to be done to his attackers. Yet, as time wore on and the investigation by the authorities dug deeper, evidence began to surface suggesting that this attack may never have taken place at all. In fact, with the evidence now available to the authorities, it is he, the man who claims to have been attacked, who has now been arrested and charged with felony for disorderly conduct for allegedly filing a false police report claiming he was the victim of a hate crime assault. What we've seen, if you've been following along in the news recently, has, is that the accuser has now become the accused. The, the plaintiff has now become the prosecuted. Why? Because the mountain of evidence demonstrates that it is he who is guilty, not those he accused. Brethren, it seems we have a similar situation presented to us here in John chapter 5. With the religious leaders leveling charges against Jesus, standing in the place of plaintiff, they accuse Jesus of claiming to be God. You can turn there with me to John chapter 5. We are going to discover that in the ensuing discourse, we will, dis we will see that it is not Jesus who is actually the true defendant. In fact, the appearance of Jesus' defense before the prosecuting religious legalists is about to take a turn in a very different direction. Look there at chapter 5. We're going to contemplate this ongoing conversation between Jesus and the Jewish leaders following his healing of the invalid. Look at verse 30. We're going to read from verse 30 through verse 47. I can do nothing on my own, Jesus continues. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. 
And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you. For you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Brethren, if you remember, the the conversation we're in now between Jesus and the religious Jewish leaders all began because Jesus performed a miracle on the Sabbath. When questioned, Jesus claimed that he had every right to perform that miracle on the Sabbath. Why? Because he was working as his father was working. And the Jews were outraged. Look at verse 18. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And indeed, brethren, If you were here two weeks ago, you would know that he did make such a claim. Verses 19 through 21 demonstrate that explicitly. In fact, haven't we discovered in our journey through John bold and repeated declarations by Jesus that he is God? From John 1.1 all the way through verse 29 of this chapter, Jesus has not shied away from revealing his identity as the divine Messiah. And yet, this begs a very basic question. How can we trust him? How do we know he is who he said he is? How can we verify who this man is who claims such big things? Fair question, isn't it? Now, we're reading this from 2,000 years on and the deluge of knowledge and evidence. But why should the Jewish hearers, who had just become acquainted with this Jesus and his small band of disciples, why should they believe him? It's a legitimate question. On what basis is this man claiming to be God? You realize in verses 19 to 29, he has just declared himself to be the judge of the world, the giver of life and death, the sustainer of all things in this universe. How do we know? Now, notice in our text, Jesus doesn't even stop to allow this question to be asked. He just assumes this question. He he assumes the question of why should we believe him? And, And for good reason. Jesus knew as a Jew that in Jewish law, it was required that two or three witnesses were needed to establish any fact. Deuteronomy 19.15 Listen to this, a single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. We know from Jewish tradition outside of Scripture, Mishnah, Ketubah, from Josephus, that the Jewish tradition upheld a requirement for at least two witnesses. This is something Jesus acknowledges in verse 30. Look at verse 30. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now look at this. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. Now, it's important for us to understand what Jesus is not 
saying. He is not saying that his testimony is not valid. But rather, he is insisting that if he is the only one to bear witness about himself, then his testimony cannot possibly be true. Why? Well, hasn't he just declared that he only does what the Father reveals? If then the Father doesn't even bear witness to him, how could he possibly be speaking the truth? By his own testimony, he would be false. Do you see? So he's just labored extensively, verses 19 to 29, to establish a certain framework or a paradigm by which we understand all the things that he does. Look at verse 19. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. And then again, verse 30, I can do nothing on my own. So Jesus is establishing a paradigm through which we are to see everything he does. Namely, he only does what the Father tells him to do. So then it would make logical sense, wouldn't it, that if the Father refuses to testify of his identity, his own testimony would be false. But in fact, the Father does bear witness to the Son, a truth Jesus quickly reveals in verse 32. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony he bears about me is true. He's speaking about the Father. The Father does bear witness to the Son. And brethren, this is the primary witness to Jesus Christ. The Father is the first and last word, the final authority. Every other witness who would testify to Christ must be subservient to the Father. In fact, the whole world could witness to Christ, but if God the Father remains silent, those witnesses would fall on the ash heap of irrelevance. Let God be true and every man a liar. So we see, God the Father does testify of Christ, and he is the first of five witnesses to Christ that we see in this passage. Now, we're going to examine the Father's witness a little later on in verses 37 and 38. So, let's look for now at the first witness, aside from the Father, which we'll see in a few verses, the first witness that Jesus brings to the stand to testify of his identity. Witness number one, John. Not the author John, that's the apostle, John the Baptist. Look at verse 33. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth, not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. Now notice, Jesus says, you sent to John. When did they do this? Well, back in chapter 1, verse 19, we read that the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you? They had sent a delegation to him to discover his identity. And what did they receive? Well, they received John's public identification of Jesus as the Messiah. And there are three dimensions of John's witness that I would like to simply highlight for you today from Jesus' words here. First, notice that John was a peculiar witness. He was peculiar in the sense that he was a prophet. He was really the last of the prophets in line with Isaiah, Malachi, Jeremiah, and the like, John was commissioned by God to speak for God, to announce the imminent arrival of the Messiah. So in that sense, he was not an ordinary witness. John was a particular vessel called to action by God for a particular moment in redemptive history. You know, Jesus' words here are a fulfillment of Isaiah one, or, um, excuse me, Psalm 132, 17. The Lord declares in Psalm 132, I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. Isn't that what Jesus refers to John as? A burning and shining lamp? So in this sense, John was a prophet called by God, a peculiar witness. 
He had a peculiar mission for a particular time. What else do we know about John? Well, he was indwelt by the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He was called by God to be silent for approximately 30 years. And then as a 30-year-old man, he came on the scene and he ministered for a mere short six months before being thrown in jail. He ate locusts, honey. He wore a garment of camel's hair. This man was a peculiar man. Yet his witness was and is a praiseworthy witness. Look again at verse 34. Jesus says, not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things, notice, so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp. Jesus reassures us he doesn't need the witness of men. We're going to see that shortly. The divine witness is enough. But he does employ man's witness for a purpose. What is it? I say these things to you so that you may be saved. He employs John the Baptist's witness because John the Baptist was a lamp in a dark place that showed men the way to salvation. John the Baptist was a mercy to sinners inoculated to their own rebel hearts. He was a mercy because he proclaimed the Savior who would save men from their sins. And I love this description that Jesus uses. He was a burning and shining lamp. John had been lit aflame for Christ. You can feel the unction and the passion of his testimony as you read through the opening pages of the gospel. John was passionate that people would see Christ through him. He didn't want to steal the attention or gain the following. In fact, in chapter 3 and verse 30, John makes that now famous pronouncement, he must increase, but I must decrease. As the friend of the bridegroom, it was John's sole mission to introduce the bride to the groom. Once complete, he could stand to the side and rejoice over the blessed union. John's witness was a mercy to the people. And and Jesus cites it in order that they may be saved. John's witness was, John's witness is, a praiseworthy witness. And the people, notice in verse 35, were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. They entertained John's witness, for a little while anyway. They got excited about his message. Remember, everyone went out to him. There was a a bit of a buzz in the air, a hope of messianic fulfillment. That's why the Pharisees' delegation asked him, are you the Christ? He stirred up some excitement. But ultimately, they rejected John's message because they rejected the Messiah he came to announce. He was a a sort of passing fad for the religious seekers who would soon jail and kill him. But John was a passionate witness for Christ, and thus John's witness is a pattern for witness. Brethren, John saw Christ's glory as the goal, not his glory. His mission was to exalt another, not to exalt self. He was motivated by the love of Christ, not the love of pleasure, reputation, or money, which ought to cause us to ask a a very seeking question, very searching question. What is my motivation as a witness? You are called to be a witness, you know. Though you are not called as the last of the Old Testament prophets, as John was. If you are a redeemed child of God, you are called to be a witness. Just like the woman at the well in chapter 4 who encountered Christ and who immediately went back into her town and bore witness to him. Brethren, we who have tasted of the heavenly gift and have drunk of the streams of living water, we are to witness to Christ. So ask yourself, what drives my witness? Well, first, you should probably be asking, 
do you even have a witness? Could your witness be described as being driven by anything in the first place? Do you witness for Christ? Do your lips open to speak of the glories of Jesus and what He has accomplished for you? Does your tongue move to, as David says in Psalm 51, teach transgressors God's ways? Does it at all? And if you do, and you ought to, what drives that witness? Is it driven by a a legalistic burden to have your quota filled to demonstrate your holiness? Is it driven by a desire to boast to others about how evangelistic you are? Maybe it's to gather a big following. What drives your witnessing? Brethren, it ought to be a zeal to see Christ's name glorified, to see Jesus Christ introduced to his bride, the church. So John sets for us the perfect pattern of witness. He says in chapter 3, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase but I must decrease. John is the perfect pattern for witness. But now I want us to look at verse 36. As great as the witness of John was and is, there is an even greater witness. Jesus says, but the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. And now Jesus calls a second witness to the stand, namely the witness of his works. Continuing in verse 36, For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. Greater than the word of John are the works of Jesus. Now, what are these works? Well, he is saying that the works he is doing are the works of God. That was his argument back in verse 19. But what Jesus is saying is that his miraculous works are the works of the Father himself. In in other words, they're not the tricks of a magician. Jesus is not some mere showman. No, the works he was doing were God's works. The works he was doing were peculiarly divine. I mean, remember our context. Jesus has just healed a man who had been paralyzed for 38 years. But mind you, these miraculous wonders were not works done for their own sake. In fact, tell me, how, what other word is used to describe the works of Jesus? It begins with an S. Signs. That's what you were all thinking. The, the, the works Jesus did were signs. Now, a sign, by its very definition, points away from itself towards something else. Brethren, the signs Jesus performed were meant to point to the Savior, the miracles to the Messiah. Oh, brethren, don't we realize this, that when the miracles and the signs become the preoccupation, their purpose is missed. When miracles become an end in themselves, they fall lifeless on the soul of the one witnessing them. Why? Because a miraculous work is a sign pointing to and revealing the person of Christ. It's a validation of his claim to be who he said he is, the Messiah. So brethren, when miracles stand as a sign pointing elsewhere, they prove to be a powerful stimulus to the lost sinner to cast their condemned soul upon Jesus. They're a validation of who he is what they're designed to do. They're meant to demonstrate his divinity. And that's what we find in the signs, isn't it? He healed the incurable, demonstrating himself to have the life-giving power of God. He turned water into wine, demonstrating himself to have the very power of God ruling over the molecular makeup of the universe. He provided food for the hungry, demonstrating himself to have the life-sustaining power of God. He made the blind to see spiritually and physically. He raised the dead, 
demonstrating victory over death itself, mind you, an attribute of God alone. Brethren, these were the works that, as Jesus says in John 15, no one else did, nor could do. In fact, so peculiarly divine were the works of Jesus that he reinforces their witness in chapter 10. You can turn there briefly with me. We'll look at just a few verses, or you can just listen. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. Take your eyes down to verse 37. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Brethren, Jesus, in his works, was revealing himself to be one with the Father. His works are God's works. So, when Philip asks Jesus in John 14, show us the Father, Jesus would respond, have I been with you so long, Philip? When you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Brethren, no man could do what Christ did. No mere man controls the weather with his words. No mere mortal can speak substance into being. No man can do what Christ did. For no man could enter a grave dead and walk out alive by the power of their own will. Now, some at that point will undoubtedly say, but, but, but the very fact that he died is enough evidence of his mortality and his humanity. Well, yes. Jesus as a man did die, but as God, he had the power to lay down his life and the power to take it up again, as he declares in John 10, 18. No man has the power to put down his life and take it up at will. Brethren, as the second witness called to the stand, Jesus' miracles attest to his divine person. But it's at this point that he then calls a third witness, really the primary witness, the witness of the Father. Look at verse 37. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. So this is the supreme witness from whom every other witness is derived. And yet, the Jewish leaders even rejected the Father's witness. How so? Well, Jesus reveals it in a threefold rejection. First, they rejected the Father's voice. Look there in 37. His voice you have never heard. But wait a moment. Hadn't Israel heard heard the Father's voice repeatedly? Moses heard it. Exodus 33.11 tells us that the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. The prophets heard it repeatedly. Samuel, Nathan, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, they all heard the voice of God, didn't they? You know, even the the Israelites as a nation heard it. Deuteronomy 4.12, then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. But seeing as these Jews refused to hear the voice of God in Jesus, Jesus' indictment against them is that they have never heard God's voice. Having ears, They do not hear. Brethren, what we've got to understand is Jesus is declaring that when he speaks, God the Father speaks. He would testify later in chapter 12 that he had not spoken on his own authority, but the Father who sent him has given him a commandment, what to say and what to speak. Therefore, in rejecting Jesus' words, they were revealing their deafness to the Father's words. But further, they rejected not only the Father's voice, but they rejected the Father's form. Verse 37, his form you have never seen. 
But Jacob saw the form of God in Genesis 32. But of course, these religious men were blind to the form of God's appearing in that God's form was appearing in His Son. Remember what I said in John 14? Or cited, Philip, show us the Father. If you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. To see Christ was to see the form of God, albeit veiled in the flesh. No man sees God and lives. It was veiled. God in the flesh veiled, but His form was seen but they had no eyes to see it. The third indictment that Jesus brings in de denying the witness of the Father is that they rejected the Father's Word. Look at verse 38. You do not have His Word abiding in you, for you do not believe the One whom He has sent. Brethren, we've got to understand that the patriarch Joshua had meditated upon God's Word day and night, storing it in his heart and mouth so as not to transgress it. We learn of that in Joshua 1.8. The psalmist in Psalm 119.11 declares that he has, stores, has stored up God's Word in his heart that he might not sin against him. Brethren, it is by delighting in and meditating upon the Word of God that the, the man of Psalm 1 is blessed. But these Jewish leaders, they rejected not only the Scriptures, as we will see in a moment, but they rejected the very Word of God, the very Logos of God, Jesus Himself. Therefore, by rejecting the Lagos, they demonstrated the rejection of all of God's Word. Look at that in verse 38. You do not have His Word abiding in you for or because you do not believe the one whom He has sent. This for in the middle of verse 38 is Jesus' introduction of the final straw of evidence. You do not believe me. That's the final piece of evidence demonstrating the rejection of God's voice, form, and word. And friends, we need to understand an implication of this for our times. It's a common thing to say, isn't it? Well, well we all worship the same God in reference to other false religions. Brethren, sadly, whether it's, whether it's Roman Catholicism, whether it's Judaism, Islam, Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, haven't you heard it said? Well, at least they're sincere. And at the end of the day, we're all worshiping the same God. But, but brethren, Jesus doesn't allow for that possibility. Sure, you may name the same God, you may claim the same monotheistic God of the Bible, but if you reject Jesus for who He says He is, you automatically reject the Father for who He is. Here Jesus says to the religious Jews, you do not hear, see, or know the Father because you do not believe the Son whom He has sent. The Apostle John would later write in 1 John 2, 23, no one who denies the Father, or I'm sorry, who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Brethren, it's a one-to-one -one correlation. You deny the person of Christ, you deny the Father. This is why everything hinges upon the person of Jesus. Every religion, every claim, every way hinges upon how you answer this question, who is Jesus Christ? He is not merely a man. He is not merely a moral teacher or a miracle worker or a messenger. He is not merely a minister or a missionary. He is the Messiah who is truly man, truly God, God incarnate, God in the flesh. What you do with Jesus determines where you spend eternity. Brethren, if that wasn't enough, Jesus then calls a fourth witness to the stand. Witness number four, the Bible. Verse 39, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about Me. Yet, you refuse to come to Me that you may have life. And here it is, friends, the most damning witness of them all. Why? Because it's on the pages of the Holy Scripture 
in which we find every other witness. It's from these pages. Even as Jesus spoke to the Jews who would have held in their hands or had memorized on their hearts the Old Testament Scriptures, it is on those pages that we learn of the testimony of the Father. It's on those pages that we learn of the works of Jesus. It's where we hear of John the Baptist's life and witness. Rejecting the Scriptures is to reject all the witnesses. To reject God's Word is to reject God Himself. Brethren, to reject the source of life is to reject the hope of life. But the religious Jews and the scribes and the devout Pharisees would protest, but we study the Torah. We've memorized it as children. We've given our lives to doctrine and theology. And they had. Jesus admits as much. The ESV says at the start of 39, you search the Scriptures, but it might as well be translated as the NIV has it, you study the Scriptures diligently. Or as the Berean Bible has it, you pour over the Scriptures. Brethren, they studied the Scriptures as if their lives depended upon it. They, they really thought they did. Look, verse 39, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. You see, the Jewish understanding was that the more you studied the Torah, the more hope you had of being accepted by God. They devoutly poured into the Scriptures. It was their salvation. Oh, but my, my dear friends, what they failed to realize was that there is nothing intrinsically life-giving when you read and memorize the Bible. The life comes from understanding and believing the words you read. And guess what? All the Scriptures pointed to Jesus and they missed it entirely. Isn't this what Paul said about his fellow Jews in Romans 10? I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Now listen, this is Romans 10.4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. But they missed it. They missed it entirely. They missed the, 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 the reality that the Scriptures are not an end in themselves. Knowing the Scriptures, reading the Scriptures, memorizing the Scriptures, teaching the Scriptures, listening to them being taught, none of that is an end in itself. Have you ever wondered how men have been able to stand in pulpits and preach the Word of God for years? Decades, some of them. And then in the end, reject the gospel to live lives of sin. Has it ever baffled you? How someone can know the word, memorize it, discuss it, and love doing so, and be totally enslaved to their lust? Oh, brethren, It's because the Word of God is not an end in itself. The Word of God is meant to point away from itself and to faith in the Word, Jesus Christ. And so it was with the religious to whom Jesus spoke. They had studied the Word, but they rejected its message. And and let me take a few moments now to show you, to tell you the message of Scripture. We read in Luke 24, 27 that Jesus, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, interpreted to his disciples in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And he tells them here in, in chapter 5, verse 40, it is, or 39, it is they that bear witness about me. How do the scriptures bear witness to Christ? From the Garden of Eden to the prophet Malachi, the scriptures demonstrate the utter bankruptcy of the human soul and their hopelessness before a holy God. From beginning to end, the scriptures declare that God is holy, which means God is good. And His goodness cannot abide sin. 
He can't embrace and accept sin. His goodness demands His justice. And you and I, oh, we're sinners who've sinned irreparably, having broken God's righteous law. And the Scriptures go to great lengths to prove it. Jeremiah 17.9, the heart is deceitful and desperately sick. Genesis 6.5, the Lord saw the wickedness of man upon the earth and that the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. Brethren, that's the message that the Jews were to understand, that they had broken the law and they had no hope of keeping it. The greatest commandment should have brought them to their knees. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Impossible. Impossible. No way is that happening in this sin-plagued, depraved heart of mine. But the Scriptures didn't end there. Don't you remember the myriad of promises for redemption? Genesis 3.15 reveals a Messiah to be the offspring of a woman who would crush the head of the serpent. Genesis 12.3 tells us that he would come from the offspring of Abraham, blessing all the nations of the earth. He would be a prophet like Moses to whom God said we must listen, Deuteronomy 18.15. Micah 5.2, he would be born in Bethlehem of Judah. Isaiah 7.14, he would be born of a virgin. 2 Samuel 7.16, he would have a throne, a kingdom, and a dynasty starting with King David that would last forever. Isaiah 9.6, he would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and would possess an everlasting kingdom. Zechariah 9.9, 9, he would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, righteous and having salvation, coming with gentleness. Isaiah 53.5, he was pierced for our transgression, crushed for our iniquity. Isaiah 53.9, he would die among the wicked ones but be buried with the rich. Psalm 16.10, he would be resurrected from the grave for God would not allow his Holy One to suffer decay. Daniel 7, he would come again from the clouds of heaven as the Son of Man. Malachi 4.2, he would be the Son of Righteousness for all who revere him and look for his second coming. Zechariah 12, he is the one whom Israel will recognize as the one they pierced, causing them bitter grief. Brethren, the Old Testament scriptures did not merely mention this coming Messiah in passing once or twice. The prophetic prediction saturated the pages of scripture. Aside from these blatant prophecies, there are the types and shadows pointing to Christ. He's the second Adam, the priest after the order of Melchizedek. Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Boaz, David, all pointing to the redemptive purposes and accomplishment to be fulfilled in him. Types and shadows predicting his arrival. Further, the rock, the manna, the bronze serpent lifted up in the camp, the ark in which Noah was saved, all pointing to Christ. Brethren, think of the entire sacrificial system. Didn't it point to the ultimate Passover lamb? Oh, brethren, the unity with which the Scriptures predicted His coming character and work are overwhelming. Can you read Isaiah 53 and come to any other conclusion it was speaking about Christ? Though we are sinners who have broken God's law and thus deserve God's wrath, a Messiah, a Redeemer, is said to be coming who will save us from our sins. That is the message of Scripture. And that is the message these leaders missed entirely. This ought to terrify us. You mean to tell me that I can devote my entire life to religious studies and miss the message of eternal life? Oh yeah, that's what I mean to tell you. I have found it very interesting and equally disturbing as I have studied the Bible throughout the years in preparation for preaching that as I pick up any overview of any biblical book, a commentary, a critical scholarly work, I undoubtedly find at the start and throughout dozens, if not hundreds, of pages dedicated to the liberal scholars' attempts to alter or discredit the original intent or orthodox understanding of any given passage, book, or truth. 
It is fascinating that a great many of the modern-day biblical scholars are rank liberals who deny the basic inerrancy, infallibility, and inspiration of their Bible. They give their lives to the text, and they miss the entire message. They can study for endless hours and write with great precision and eloquence on the biblical text and entirely miss the main thrust on nearly every page. Brethren, so it was with the Jewish leaders. So it was with Saul before he met Christ. So it is today with countless millions. The Scriptures testified to Jesus. And my question for you, has it been this way with you? Do you want a good test to know? Here's a good test. Ask yourself, what accompanies your reading of Scripture? Listen to Paul address the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 4. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Verse 6, you became imitators of us and the Lord. They received the word and it changed their lives. Verse 9, a report concerning the Thessalonians that they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Brethren, the Scriptures testify to Christ and demand that you respond. You want to know if you've spent your life pouring over the Scriptures in vain, what has it affected in your life? You realize the Scriptures are never to be read to merely engage your mind and, in, 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 and fill your intellectual arsenal of knowledge. The Scriptures are always, and I mean always, every time you read them, intended to transform your life as you submit to and obey them. They are meant to draw you to Jesus as the anchor of your soul, something that this religious crowd rejected. In the words of D.A. Carson, no independence is more arrogant and more delusive than religious independence, which reaches its tragic climax when the central meaning of Scripture is perverted. And thus, brethren, we have the fourth witness, the Bible. Brethren, Jesus now turns to a fifth and final witness, but in doing so, he turns the judicial table on his listeners. All of a sudden, the, the courtroom language turns. How so? Let's read on and I'll show you. Verse 41, I do not receive glory from people. In other words, Jesus' aim wasn't to receive glory by any means necessary. His end goal was, to receive, was not to receive their praise. Verse 42, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. Well, Jesus, how do you know this? Well, because, verse 43, I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. Here it is again, folks, that offensive reality of the exclusivity of Jesus. If you don't have the Son, you do not have the Father. But if another comes in his own name, you will receive him. Oh, oh, yes, they rejected and persecuted Jesus, yet their arms were wide open in acceptance to other false messiahs. As one man insightfully notes, the chief judgment on those who deny that Jesus is the promised Messiah is not so much that they have no Messiah, but that they follow false messiahs. And why do they follow false messiahs instead of Christ? Well, look at verse 44. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Where does glory fit into this? Why is Jesus bringing up glory? Oh, my friends, for the simple reality that people are eagerly willing to embrace a Messiah that comes with flattery and praise for you. But a Messiah that demands you love him more than father, mother, son, or daughter? A Messiah that demands that you die to follow Him? A Messiah that calls you to pick up your cross? Well, that's a Messiah that is entirely unacceptable to people hardwired to receive praise and glory from others for themselves. 
Let it be clear, there is no self-glorification in the gospel. The gospel calls us to die to self, not to boast in self. Which is why the self-righteous religious find it so difficult to believe in this Messiah. He is a stumbling rock, block, a rock of offense. But brethren, I want you to now listen to Jesus' next words very carefully. Verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Did you hear it? Yes. Jesus calls to the stand the fifth and final witness, Moses. But did you hear the word he used? Look again at verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses. Accuse? Wait a minute. Jesus is accusing them? I thought it was them who were accusing him. Isn't that how all this began? Jesus making his defense? Look at verse 18. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because he was making himself equal with God. They're the ones with the accusation. He claimed to be God and was thus deserving of the death penalty. And having leveled such an accusation, Jesus entered the courtroom, so to speak, and he begins bringing witnesses in his defense, five to be exact, witnesses to defend him. Right? Right? Defend him? There's something we need to understand about the Jewish legal system. The Jewish legal system did not merely call for the exoneration of an accused party. They called for the uncovering of the truth. Meaning, if someone was accused of a crime, as Jesus was here, but was then declared innocent, the legal system then wanted to discover who made the false accusation. Listen to this from just the historian Josephus. If anyone be believed to have borne false witness, let him, when he is convicted, suffer the very same punishments which against whom he bore witness was to have suffered. Whoa. In the Jewish legal system, if you accuse someone and that turned out to be false, you as the false accuser would be punished with the same punishment you wanted to inflict with your accusation. The punishment of death which the G Jewish leaders wanted to inflict upon Jesus would, if their accusation had been proven to be false, come back upon their own heads. Which means the witnesses Jesus called to the stand in the first place to defend him had now turned as voices to accuse them. Which is why Jesus turns to them and says, don't think I'll accuse you. Someone else will accuse you. Oh, how the tables have turned. Jesus has moved from the defendant to the prosecutor. And what kind of witness was Moses? Witness, the witness he made in Deuteronomy 18.15, where he said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Moses was always pointing to Christ. The Jews simply refused to see it. They saw Moses as their hope, blind to the hope toward which he incessantly pointed them. And now, because of their unbelief, they no longer stood as prosecutors before Jesus. They now stood as defendants before an overwhelming testimony of witnesses. And the verdict? Guilty. The punishment? Death. Eternal death. My dear friends, it is at this point that this immediately turns upon you and me. You may perceive yourself to stand in the position of prosecutor, calling God to an account for his truth. Why should I believe in Jesus? Who gives him any right to tell me how to live? What is this Bible other than a fairy tale book made by men? 
But then the witnesses line up. Moses and the prophets, the sacred writings, the works of Jesus, the words of John, the testimony of the Father. If you cannot come to see the validity of Jesus' divine claim to be the Messiah, the problem lies not in the testimony of the witnesses presented to you. The problem lies within your rebel heart. You refuse to come to Him that you may have life. And let me tell you, you will not stand as a prosecutor for long. In the final day, you will be called to give an account for your life and the rejection of Jesus as the Christ while witness after witness after witness stands to condemn you in your sin. Oh, the utter folly of these men thinking they could put Jesus on the defendant stand. You know, even when they did get their way, they tried him before Pilate, found him guilty on false charges, and they crucified him. But even then, they did not realize that the final judgment would be theirs. And Moses, Moses, that great patriarch in whom they boasted and hoped, would be the first to stand up in the courtroom of God's judgment and demand their destruction. And my friends, my question to you this morning is, will he do the same to you? And so we see the accusers are now accused. You know, just as that young man in Chicago claimed to have been a victim of a violent hate crime but was soon discovered to be the real perpetrator, so these religious leaders have proven themselves to be the true violators of the law. Hoping to impugn Jesus upon the basis of a blasphemous claim, they revealed themselves to be the true blasphemers, denying the reality of his divinity. And let me just say to you, Christian, let Jesus' words and the witness he calls to the stand buttress your faith in the gospel. You have not been called to believe an irrational, illogical, inconsistent message. The message of Scripture, the message of the gospel, is grounded upon witness after witness. Therefore, stand boldly upon the truth. As Jesus was persecuted and prosecuted for the truth, so will you be. Are you willing to stand trial as he was? The overwhelming evidence lies in your favor. And though they may try you and find you guilty in human courts, the only court that matters is heaven's. The only judgment that you should concern yourself with, God's. Let's pray. Father, in the face of such an overwhelming witness, we confess Jesus Christ as the divine Messiah. Pray, Lord, that any who deny Him this morning would repent of their sin even at this moment and put their faith in Him. And I pray that those of us who have entrusted our lives to Him, that we would be buttressed in that faith, that we would be established in it, confident no matter what human courts come against us, fearing only the heavenly one. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.